never had a home like this And the prophet said, be careful what you wish Never had to think twice, always knew my home was in paradise Never had a home like this And the prophet said, be careful what you wish Never had to think twice, always knew my home was in paradise our producer, Mr. Bradley Tucker, I know, has this. Uh, he's eager to have you oh, take a walk back. He has this lovely poster. I Thank have you, that. From uh, the final month, the final yeah. days of, of Wetlands Remember that? Preserve. I guess I'm curious uh, what this evokes, what this brings back, whether it be of this particular moment or the club in general or just whatever leaps out of you. So, this poster is the reason that the combo of the New Deal and the Disco Biscuits is happening right now at the Capitol Theater. The Disco Biscuits had this show on the books, and then this poster was unearthed from a relics or a wetland storage unit that had to be closed down and got moved into the relics office. And I feel like every few years, I mean, this poster is what, 16 years old now, yeah. something like that? You know, so a few of these posters seemingly get unearthed every few years and they go to some well-deserving fans um, that are definitely within our immediate circle. Um, and it's definitely something that is proudly displayed in, you know, music offices or music fans' homes. And these posters got, uh, you know, found from the storage unit and I saw them up online and I was like, okay, number one, Let's take them down. This isn't something that is about, you know, selling them and, and making money, regardless of how cheap or expensive yeah. you want to make them as collector's items. This is something that we need to give out to people that are deser yeah. deserving of this poster. And this is something, this billing is something that was kind of like special, right? Mm -hmm. This is what, you know, the wetlands was all about, mm -hmm. right? Is being able to help launch, um, you know, this live Tronica movement that Jamie and I, you know, are, are forefathers of, mm -hmm. if you will. So once I saw that, I was like, what a perfect billing to do that at a Peter Shapiro venue mm -hmm. and let's do it again. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're here. I mean, yeah. you know, it was a perfect. We, in those days, um, when we played with these guys when we could, uh, we would do our best. The New Deal used to start out their shows by playing out of a DJ. Uh, and that was just a simple way for us to kickstart the improv. Right? Whatever the DJ was spinning, we would just start playing whatever was happening there. They'd fade out the DJ and we'd keep going. It was kind of like a, you know, it's kind of like a DJ set. It's like something ended, something else started. We would try our best in these earlier, in these days where we had a lot less gear on stage, um, to, we, we'd either play out of them or most often we'd be before them and we would try and get it so that they would play out of us and we would just start switching instruments. So one, like Dan would, Mark would come on and Mark would start playing and Dan would walk off and I would start, I would walk off or you know, Aaron would come on and play and I'd walk off and they'd, we'd have our rigs as crammed together as we could on the stage and then we would try and create these seamless sets as well, right? Um, and I think we were doing that at this point. Um, this was, <clears throat> I'm thinking that, was this, was this 2001 right before it closed down? Yeah, um, yeah this was, uh, and it closed down early because of 9-11. It was supposed to close down like a week later or something like that. So this turned out to be one of the 10 last shows, a couple of pair sh last shows that would happen at the Wetlands. Um, when I walked into the Wetlands for the first time, the first thing I said to myself was, it sure looks smaller than what I thought it was gonna be. Right. Um, and then the second thing that happened was, this might have been our first time to play in New York City early, early on, and uh, you know, we're in big bad Manhattan down there in Tribeca, and then Tribeca back then was still a little scarier. And it's New York, and you know, we're like some opening band for something, I don't know what, early, early on. And we're like loading our gear in, and there's all these like big bouncers there, like Carl, and, you know, and those guys. And uh, someone comes in and goes, you guys the band? We're like, yeah. We're like, you the guys from Canada? Yeah. Well, all right. Welcome to the Wetlands. Have a great show. We're like, okay. This is, this place is good. I like this place. And so, you know, yeah. Like I said, it was smaller than I remembered that I thought it would be. But then when I, th I was thinking about it now, and I was talking with Pete Shapiro yesterday, I was like, man, in my mind, that place could hold a thousand people. You know, I mean. Uh, sometimes it did, by the way. Yeah, you know? sometimes <laughs> it did. That's true. We won't tell the fire marshal that, but you know, it, 
in my mind, as I think about it now, it could be RFK Stadium. Like it was just, you know, huge in, in my memories. Yeah, I, I definitely remember Brownstein so actively trying to engage Chris Zahn, who was booking yeah. the wetlands at the time, and the phone calls and yeah. the letters, right? Because yeah. this is before email, yeah. you know, trying yeah. to get us booked, like you know, trying to get us booked on wetlands. That would be the defining moment of, you know, the building of a foundation of a career. You know, number one, if you're a Philadelphia band to be able to make it into New York, or, yeah. or a Canadian yeah. band to be able to make it into New York, yeah. you know, but the wetlands was where you needed to be, mm -hmm. was where you needed to play. And you could play it was the rough. lines then. But and we did. Yeah, and we did too. <laughs> but you're not playing the wetlands when you're doing that. Right. Um, you know, and, and Mark really, I mean, he made it happen, you know, with all those phone calls and all those letters. And we literally kicked open the door of the wetlands to get our, you know, to get in. Yeah. And then and I, we, were the, we were the new wave of bands sure. to play there because sure. it was sort of, uh, it was the tail end of the sort of Spin Doctors, Blues Traveler, uh, kind of thing that was happening in that sort of like funky rock and that was tailing off and we were kind of sliding in it was I think the 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 club itself at that time was was in transition as to what it was going to present itself as I mean it was always going to still be the wetlands it was always still going to be like sort of that grassroots hippy dippy kind of thing you know it had the VW bus and all that but where was it going to go what was the next level what was the next level that was going to happen? Who were those bands going to be? And there were a bunch of bands that were sort of right before we sort of started happening that were kind of in that scene. I mean, I won't start naming any names, not that I'm going to be you know, disparaging about it, but just like there was like that level of bands that was sort of playing there and they were kind of good, but they kind of were not. Jiggle the handle, I'm going to see yeah, pods. Uh, uh, yeah. Moon, <laughs> Moon Boot Lover. Moon Boot Lover. Uh, Peter Prince is a phenomenal one. guitar player. God Street yeah. One. Yeah. So those kinds of bands, <laughs> were there and they he said him not me uh and Aaron's brave uh, yes he is nah, but whatever they were all good bands no, no, right? no, no, no. for sure they were they were all good bands i enjoyed watching them i remember going to see the sea pods when they came to montreal but uh that was not that didn't have legs that didn't have the strength to go anywhere right and so they were sort of treading water as far as i felt the club and the, and this and the scene was sort of treading water as Fish was getting bigger and the Spin Doctors kind of just blew apart and Blue Traveler did whatever they did, there was a void. And we kind of just stepped in, not knowing what we were doing. Like, we didn't, the band, the New Deal never was consciously a, an electronic y kind of band. Like, as I always said, I'm just, I was sort of just playing soft rock up there. Like, I'm playing Steely Dan chords while the other two guys were doing the heavy lifting. They're doing the beats, right? And they're making it sound cool. And I'm just kind of playing, you know, Pablo Cruzy kind of stuff up there. Um, but that was where it needed to go. And then the minute that it sort of caught on, it's like it was, it was in. And everybody was like, I dig this. I can get this, right? It's not, uh, it's not too far left. It's not like, you know, Aphex Twin. It's not like crazy dance music that I really can't get. It's like a nice amalgam of things that I can really get into right and that was sort of the next step it's interesting is that because like you were pioneering it or is it because the musical ear of you know the mid to late 90s was ready for it and it was just if the new deal the disco biscuit soundtrack tech nine whatever it was wasn't going to do it somebody else was going to well yeah that's a good question um i can't think of any other bands besides the three of us at that time that were sort of doing it you know, I mean, I guess somebody would have, you know, it's a big, big world. But, uh, you know, all our contemporaries at the time, the Fat Mamas of the world and the Ulus of the world and, and uh, the, uh, what was the trio from uh, Boston? The Slip, they're all great bands, but they weren't, it wasn't that style, you know? So somebody would have done it, right. but, and then we definitely fed off each other in that regard. It was like, oh, these guys are, the Disco Biscuits are doing something really cool. And that sort of gave me uh, the, not the faith, but like the strength to be like, yeah, okay, this is, this is good. This is like happening and these guys are, are feeling good about it. I'm going to feel good about it and I'm just going to keep doing it, right? But what really was big for me with that with you guys, it wasn't that, oh, these guys are playing electronic music or that they're playing dance music and I feel good about it. It's that these guys are improvising in that style and I feel good about that. I can do that, you know? And that's the big thing. It's like, 
anybody can put together a, a band that's going to play sort of dancey beats and put some keys on top of it, and away you go. But that's not what you guys do. It's not what you guys were doing. And that, to me, is the biggest thing. Like, your, you know, so much of the discussion of your band is about your jams, right? Sure. And that was a huge, uh, that had a huge impact on me. I was like, okay, so there's a band out there that is, you know, moving towards the top of their game in playing danceable style music, but improvising at the same time. I'm in, sign me up, where do I do it, right? Um, that, and so I sort of fed off of that when I would dig you guys. It was like, yeah, your songs are great. Your, your songs are awesome, I love them. But it's like yesterday when we were listening to you guys, sitting there with Joel, we were listening to, I don't remember what song it was, but there was a, there was a part that went on five minutes, the patience that you guys were displaying in developing this groove, and Mark was just sort of pedaling on, on the same key, and playing different stuff, but maintaining the same sort of vibe, and you were doing the same thing, and Joel and I just turned to each other, and we're like, man, this is like musical patience. You know, we're like, we have, and we do that too, but it's like, this is where it's at, to be able to have the confidence and to have the foresight and the patience and the ears to sit there and let it groove and know that it's good and just let it unfold. That was the big thing that yesterday and 15 years ago, 16 years ago, when I would watch these guys play. It's like, they're not going anywhere. You're not going anywhere. You're letting it happen. I think it's a maturity thing too. A maturity mm. and, and, and a confidence, right? Mm. I mean, you know, you're always chasing something. You're always chasing wanting to do something else, not necessarily be content with where you are. I, don't, I, I always thought that it was a, a maturity thing, something that we eventually found some confidence with. What's interesting is that the Disco Biscuits has always tried to find different points to, you know, a launch pad, if you will, to jump off the cliff into improvisation. And it's not just, we start the song here, opens up into a free form improvisation, and we end the song at the big chorus, right. right? It's, you know, well, what if we jump off that cliff, you know, at the very beginning of the song? What if we just loop these random two chords that we've never looped before? That then becomes, you know, the improvisation. What if we jam into the end of the song and then you get to the end of it and start it from the beginning, right? The whole, like, ethos of the Disco Biscuits. Um, um, and, and we still find new moments to do that in. What's interesting is that if you take that to the extreme, you have the New Deal, which doesn't even have the blueprint of, you know, songs necessarily. Yeah. But, you know, it starts off with how are we going to start this? I don't know. That's how we're <laughs> going to start it. OK, yeah. there we are, you know, and developing these themes that have evolved into the songs yeah. that we know of the New Deal yeah. all started within an improvisation at one point in yeah. time where you go back and you listen to the tapes or you remember it because it passes the memory test of a hook, yeah. you know, and that becomes the song. Beanstalk Festival is centered around an unforgettable live music experience in the mountains. We've seen it evolve into a celebration of the Colorado music scene. What sets Beanstalk apart is our desire to create a genuine experience for people. We let the music, environment, and community speak for themselves. Once you get Team Bean together, the magic just happens. That's how our community is, and that's why Colorado has become a modern musical mecca. The community has rallied around Beanstalk, and 2016 is poised to be the best year yet. We'll see you in the mountains in June.